So it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, uh, Professor Jose Avalos, our, our colleague from Chemical and Biological Engineering and the, and the Endlinger Center, like I said. Uh, so, so Jose is one of those, uh, one of those guys that, that you remember. Uh, I was around when we hired him. I haven't been with the center that long. But uh, you, know, you remember certain things in your scientific career, and Jose's uh, application and process of joining the faculty was one of them. And, and the reason why is because the area in which he's working, I think, is really a true frontier, especially in the area of, of energy science. And so Jose is involved, as you'll see, in, in an array of areas, uh, including things like synthetic biology and, and metabolism research and biofuels. So this is really, a, 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 I think, a, a transformative area of, of research, and we're very fortunate to have Jose here with us. Um, so he uh, began his education in Mexico City, uh, where he earned his uh, BSc degree, and then moved on to Imperial College London to uh, earn a master's degree and then uh, earned a PhD back here in the United States uh, at Johns Hopkins University, and then did a, a postdoc uh, at MIT in the Whitehead Institute in Rockefeller before joining the, the Princeton faculty. Uh, I'm also uh, very proud to say that uh, Jose is one of our recipients of uh, the affiliates RFP, um, so we'll hear in the fall uh, some of the results of that. Um, but uh, please join me in, in welcoming, and, and Jose, uh, take it away, it's all yours. Okay, thank you, Paul, for that introduction, and I want to thank you all for being here to listen to my talk. I also want to take a moment to thank uh, uh, Mr. Anger uh, for his uh, generosity and his vision. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about biofuels, and of all the renewable sources of energy, biofuels is perhaps the one that has attracted most criticism. Uh, some of them have been fair, some of them have been not so fair, but hopefully by the end of the talk, today, you'll be convinced that, uh, that biofuels play an essential role in the uh, sustainable energy landscape of the future. Uh, and a lot of those uh, criticisms that the field has received uh, can also be uh, overcome by uh, more uh, technological development. So biofuels is really no more than an extension of the use of biomass to, to uh, obtain energy. And biomass is no more than solar energy trapped by photosynthesis in chemical bonds. And so we've been using biomass for energy since, essentially since we've been humans. There's evidence that uh, early hominids like Homo erectus has been using uh, fire for, uh, from wood for energy uh, for as, as far away, as far, as far back as two million years ago. So uh, when we talk about biofuels today, we talk about the, the, the <coughs> natural extension of this source of energy uh, because the, the solid form of wood is not a practical form. So, so uh, essentially in, in liquid biofuels, uh, what we try to do is harness the same chemical bonds that were trapped uh, by photosynthesis, but now in a more practical way to use them. So to this date, uh, about half of the renewable source of energy come from biomass. And of this, roughly about another half comes from uh, biofuels uh, themselves. So um, you might think, well, when you use biofuels, you're still burning them and you're still producing CO2. And that's absolutely true. But the difference uh, from fossil, uh, fossil fuels is that biofuels belong to a much shorter term balanced cycle in which the source of the, of the carbon, of the uh, chemical bonds that were trapped through photosynthesis are fixed back into the biosphere in a matter of, of months. Whereas when we uh, consume, when we burn chemical bonds from fossil fuels, they belong to a much longer term uh, uh, that can take millions of years to, for it to be fixed and then reform into these liquid fuels. So this ends up in an unbalance that, that ends up in accumulation of CO2 in the atmosphere. So the bulk of the liquid biofuels is, uh, is meant to be used in transportation that, as you can see here, it takes about, is about roughly a quarter of the amount of CO2 that is emitted in the U.S. Uh, per year. So that's about uh, 6.8 uh, billion metric tons of CO2 uh, in 2014. So, so one thing that is very critical when we talk about transportation is the energy density, of course, because you don't want to be moving around with huge volumes or huge amount of weight. And so in that regard, 
uh, uh, fossil fuels have been fantastic because things like diesel or biofuel or, or, or gasoline can pack up to 35 megajoules of energy per liter. And so uh, uh, when you compare these to biofuels, biofuels, uh, uh, I'm showing you three examples. Uh, they're not quite as high, but they're pretty decent in the amount of energy they pack per volume. Now, if you go at other uh, renewable sources of energy, such as hydrogen, uh, uh, then the, that energy density goes down. Of course, hydrogen has other uh, complications like uh, safety and other practical challenges. Uh, and then we go down to batteries, and as we heard yesterday from Dan, that is the, the big challenge of batteries, right? Reaching that, those high energy densities that you would need to have an efficient form of transportation. So, of course, biofuels, as I mentioned, have received a number of challenges, uh, have a number of challenges, and, and have uh, received a number of criticism, and that includes in its life cycle, its sustainability, issues of land use, water use, the potential conflict of production of biofuels with production of food, uh, compatibility of the fuels that we're able to make with the current infrastructure to utilize fuels, and also the economic competitiveness of, competitiveness of fuels, of these biofuels with fossil fuels. So this, these challenges have led to the proposal of, of very, smart, very smart people to say that perhaps we should focus on electrification of transportation as opposed to uh, 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 um, sort of nurturing the biofuel industry. And so uh, if we take a close look at that, then you can see here, this is a, a, um, data from the uh, 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 National Resource uh, Defense Council. And so if you consider, for example, what we have right now, and you assume that 100% of personal transportation vehicles use internal combustion engines, then that's 100% <coughs> use of liquid fuels. If you now assume a scenario in which you had you managed to convince the whole population and you made it affordable enough so that they could all use plug-in hybrid vehicles, then a big chunk of it, like 40%, would now be you coming from electricity, but 60% would still be coming from liquid fuels. This is the energy to, to uh, uh, percent energy to, to get this transportation. Of course, because of this uh, increased demand in electricity, you would have to pay this by an increased in power generation of electricity. And of course, you don't want to just move the problem from one side to another. In order for this to be meaningful, this electricity should come from a renewable source as well. Now, in another, perhaps a, a more realistic, although still quite optimistic scenario, in which you split one-third even, one-third internal combustion, one-third electric vehicle, and one-third plug-in hybrids, you still have a significant amount of uh, uh, liquid fuels. And in this last scenario, in which you have uh, half and half between electrical vehicles and plug-in hybrid vehicles, you still require about 50% of liquid fuels. So it looks like, even in these very optimistic scenarios, we are going to be needing for our transportation energy at least 50% of that coming from liquid fuels. And so unless we develop sustainable biofuels, these liquid fuels will most likely come from fossil sources, and so we will still be continuing to release CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, this, is, this previous slide just contemplates uh, the, the uh, vehicles for personal use. If you look at the scenario of electrifying other, sources, other forms of transportation, then the challenges become even uh, more significant, like considering the, the multi-trillion dollars uh, of investment in the current infrastructure that uses combustion energy and li uh, 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 liquid fuels and, and combustion engines, uh, or other forms of transportation that seem uh, decades away from being able to be electrified, like uh, uh, transport, like uh, air transportation or transoceanic uh, uh, trains. So, in conclusion, liquid fuels are really not optional. So, since we are going to be needing these liquid fuels, then biofuels offer the best renewable source for these liquid fuels. Now, it, there is some reason for optimism. Uh, as uh, Dr. Williams alluded to yesterday, to this billion ton study that was uh, uh, um, done by the USDA and the Department of Energy back in 2005, it was updated in 2011. There is, uh, this study concluded that the, there is a, uh, there's a potential for the US to produce between 1.1 and 1.6 billion tons per year of sustainable biomass, this is dry weight, by, the, by 2030. And with current uh, improvements and developments in biorefinery and capacity and technology, 
this would amount to about 85 billion gallons of biofuels produced per year, or about 30% of the, nation, of the nation's uh, current petroleum consumption. So this study didn't even consider other potential advances like fuels from algae or advanced biofuels that are uh, improvements from the ones that we currently have. So there's three main routes for biofuel production. One is extraction. This is mostly used for biodiesel production. Then there's also the biochemical route that takes mostly uh, uh, sugars in the form of either simple sugars, starch, and uh, increasingly now the use of cellulosic uh, biomass. Uh, there's currently three plants, uh, commercial plants in the U.S. operating to produce uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol. There's also the thermochemical route that is in this more indiscriminate about the source of the plant material uh, and that can uh, also produce a diversity of liquid fuels. Now, my area of expertise lies in, bio, in the biochemical route, uh, 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 which has some advantages, including a lower capital investment as well as uh, uh, operational conditions that are uh, more uh, or less, less stringent than, uh, in terms of pressure and temperature than compared to the thermochemical uh, method. And so my specialty is in, in biotechnology. Uh, uh, and essentially in, in, in looking at the microorganisms that will turn uh, different sources of carbon into uh, biofuels. And so you can think about algae, uh, that these are very useful for producing lipids, for example, uh, yeast that is uh, very good at producing ethanol, and bacteria, this is clostridia uh, uh, that produces butanol. And the the big reason why the bioethanol industry has been successful is because these organisms are naturally very adept and efficient at turning sugar into ethanol. Uh, the same goes for butanol production by the, these bacteria. They produce uh, uh, butanol naturally, although they have a more complicated life cycle. Uh, and algae, uh, again, they produce oils naturally. But through the use of uh, metabolic engineering and synthetic biology, we can improve on these organisms to, for example, enhance the productivity that they, can, that they can achieve, or simplify the production, for example, moving the metabolic pathways to produce butanol from something like a bacteria that it has a complicated life cycle to a yeast, or increasing the, the microorganism tolerance to the fermentation products or the, or the conditions of fermentation, because these products, at the end of the day, are solvents that end up killing the cells. So these can also be addressed with synthetic biology or metabolic engineering. And ultimately, to produce better fuels so that we're not limited to the products that these organisms are able to naturally produce, but we can actually uh, uh, do better. So um, today I'm going to tell you about an example of uh, looking at strategies to in improve the product that we make. So instead of producing ethanol, engineering a yeast to produce a better biofuel. And so why is this important? So uh, back in 2007, there was this uh, Energy Independence and Security Act, or EISA, and the idea of this, uh, uh, essentially a mandate, is to increase the amount of biofuels that are blended into our gasolines. So it, the, the original goal was to achieve 15 billion, well, so a total of 36 billion gallons per year of biofuels uh, by the year 2022. And this is capped here. You can see the darker blue at 15 billion gallons of the amount of ethanol that can be produced from corn. You might not notice this little uh, narrower band here. This amounts to about 1 billion gallons uh, per year of biodiesel. And then these two colors up here represent both cellulosic a biofuel and also other uh, uh, advanced biofuel mandates. So all of this, this lower bar here, all of it is corn ethanol. This upper bar here is cellulosic biofuels. But these bi cellulosic biofuels are, all, are really focused mostly on production of uh, ethanol. So as I mentioned, there's three plants in the U.S. currently operating to produce uh, cellulosic biofuels, and they're all producing ethanol. This upper color here was originally meant to be heavier biofuels, uh, um, but recently uh, it, the, the, this was up, uh, the, the definition was upgraded to include 
also sugar cane ethanol. Uh, again, because this is very, is much more efficient to produce it from sugar cane than from corn. So at the end of the day, we end up with a scenario in which we are aiming to produce about 35 billion gallons of mostly ethanol by the year 2022. But ethanol has significant disadvantages, right? It has lower energy density than gasoline, about 66%. It has poor compatibility with infrastructure. So that means that most of our gasoline blends are no more than 15%. Most of them are actually 10% because of uh, sort of uh, uh, market forces and reluctance of the public to uh, adopt this, this higher percentage of gasoline, of, uh, of uh, ethanol. So putting these two things together, you can see that uh, if you replace, the, the, most of the, the, uh, the, um, the amount of uh, ethanol that we're making is to replace about 10% of gasoline, which is, well, between 6.6 and 10% of the actual energy that you get from gasoline. And this is because of the limitation with current infrastructure. Now, if you look at these mandates more closely, then there is no real magic number of where this 15 billion gallons per year comes from. It comes from the fact that we currently produce 150 billion gallons of gasoline per year. And so that, um, this 15 billion gallons accounts that 10% of the blends that we essentially use. So essentially, we're maxing out the blends that we can use. So when we talk about, when we talk about looking at uh, 35 billion gallons of ethanol produced in about a decade or less, uh, then we are uh, essentially planning to overproduce ethanol, right? Because that 35 billion gallons of ethanol would be enough to blend, if you stick with a 10% ethanol blend, it would be enough to blend uh, uh, 35, 350 billion gallons of gasoline, which is not what we're currently using. And hopefully we won't get to those numbers. So this is a scenario in which the solution would be to produce better fuels that are more compatible with infrastructure to break that limit of the 10% uh, blends that we can make. And so that's the case of these three, uh, of, of all these alcohols, but I'm going to tell you about these three in particular. These are C4s and C5s, uh, isobutanols and, and pentanols. And these uh, have higher energy density than ethanol, but most importantly are more compatible with current infrastructure, which means we can use them in higher blend. The fact that they have higher energy density also amount to the, to the, the, the fact that, if, that per acre you will able to produce more energy uh, uh, compared to ethanol. So we do this by using metabolic engineering, right? So this is a simplified map of cell metabolism. So each one of these <coughs> nodes represents a metabolite, a molecule. And they are connected by these lines which represent enzymes. And they're coded by genes, one or more genes in, in, uh, uh, for each line. And these, uh, this represents, you can imagine this is a pipeline in which you have fluxes going in many different directions. You'll notice there are no arrows because depending on the conditions that the cell is experiencing, these can be reversible, or many of these can be reversible. And so when we look at a map like this, then we say, okay, we're trying to overproduce one of these metabolites, for example, this one. And so the challenge is, what are the things you have, do you have to tinker around here to maximize the flow of carbon towards this product? Sometimes uh, the, the product that you're looking for is not even on the map. So then you have to think about adding genes that the organism doesn't naturally have so that you can build new roads to produce that product. So in this case, a further simplification of production of, uh, in this case, isobutanol is shown here in this diagram. So you have, uh, luckily, uh, um, yeast is already able to produce small amounts of isobutanol. This, this is a, a, a product of the degradation of valine, which is one of the uh, building blocks of protein. This is usually one of the things that ruin the flavor of beer and wine. So historically, people have been trying to produce less of these things. Uh, uh, now we're trying to do the opposite. Uh, so here, this, so in metabolic engineering, uh, one of the things that we do is look at how can we improve the natural ways of producing these products. So we don't want to produce it from protein, we want to produce it from sugars. So one of the things that we do is enforce the pathways or break the regulations of these genes that will produce, say, valine from glucose. So we enhance this upstream pathway to increase the production of valine. And then 
Another step would be to also then enhance the genes uh, or enhance the gene production, the, 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 the copy number of genes, so that we uh, upregulate the downstream, the degradation pathway. And so in this case, when you overexpress one of the first enzymes of the degradation pathway, you see that you go from the wild type level of production to maybe doubling the amount of isobutanol you produce. When you increase the copy number of the genes that are involved in turning glucose into uh, this amino acid, you get another doubling, perhaps. Now, if you combine both, the upstream and the, down, the first enzyme of the downstream, you actually don't get an effect. And this is different from what you would get in a bacteria. Normally, uh, uh, you would expect this to uh, uh, also be uh, uh, additive. So, so this is a complication of yeast that I'll get to in a minute. But before that, I'll tell you something else that we do in metabolic engineering is that we look at the pathways that compete with the pathway that we're trying to enhance. So in this case, uh, ethanol production is the most significant. So we can look at the pathway to produce ethanol, and we look at this enzyme. There's actually three enzymes that can do this reaction, but deleting all of them would be actually deleterious to the cell. So if we just knock out one of them, so we reduce maybe by 10 to 20% the amount of ethanol we produce, then we have another doubling of the amount of isobutanol that we make. Now, going back to why this scenario doesn't work, uh, we have to look at the uh, architecture of the cell in a little bit more detail. And then we can see that in the yeast cell, it's made up of all these different compartments. And one of them is mitochondria. So in addition to looking at the metabolic pathway and where the gene products are and where the metabolites are, we also have to be concerned about where Physically, are they located in the cell? So if we, so if we in addition to overexpressing this degradation pathway, we, we target it so that the products are produced in the mitochondria, then we do see an additive effect, a doubling of isobutanol production. Now, if we combine all these strategies of overexpressing genes, targeting to the, the right compartment, and competing, and, and the leading competing pathways, then we get a more significant increase. If we, and then in metabolic engineering, you try to look for uh, uh, what is the next thing you can do to keep pushing that flux towards the product of interest. So for example, you can uh, uh, further delete competing pathways, target full pathways to the mitochondria, and then you get more and more significant increases in the product that you're looking for. Okay, so, so um, just going to go real quick here. So the reason why this worked is because the pathways are actually broken into two different compartments. So it makes sense that targeting the pathway to mitochondria would uh, increase the production. Now, if you notice, we're only producing about a gram per liter of isobutanol, and that's obviously not enough to reach commercial viability. So we have to focus on what is our main competing pathway, and in this case, it's ethanol production. So I told you we can knock out one of the three genes, and you might ask, why can't we just knock all of them? And then you accumulate the, 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 the metabolite of interest, and then you produce more isobutanol. And the reason for that is that yeast is actually not interested in producing ethanol per se. It's interested in, in getting energy from glucose. And the way it does that is from transferring electrons from glucose to a carrier molecule, N8, called NAD. And so this receives electrons, and it's this, uh, essentially this electron transfer that produces the uh, releases the energy to produce ATP, which is what yeast is after. So while yeast can keep finding more glucose in the environment, it cannot just eat more NAD, so it needs to recycle this molecule. And the, the, the way to do that is to essentially transfer these electrons to another acceptor, to, a, to an electron acceptor molecule, and that electron acceptor molecule is the product of pyruvate decarboxylase, which, by receiving those electrons, produces ethanol. And that's the reason why yeast is so efficient at producing ethanol is because it's ultimate the, the electron sink of glycolysis. So when you knock out pyruvate decarboxylase, the yeast can no longer ferment. It could still, in principle, grow off, off of respiration, but in fact, uh, respiration is repressed in the presence of glucose in yeast, so the yeast is stuck in, in this uh, uh, state in which it can no longer grow on glucose. Now, what so the strategy that we have in metabolic engineering is then, what if we created an alternative synthetic fermentation pathway that produces a new electron acceptor such that the electro electrons from NAD get put onto this higher, uh, heavier electron acceptor and then restore this ability to recycle the NAD and thus, as a, a consequence, produces a heavier molecule that is a better fuel and that is now 
uh, make the yeast happy because it can grow on glucose again. And so this is essentially what we've been trying to do. We have actually, I think, achieved this. The problem is that um, isobutanol, so this reaction can be carried out to produce isobutanol, in which the electron acceptor is isobutyraldehyde. But uh, uh, the problem is that this is a toxic compound. So uh, the, in, in order to, to uh, overcome this, we have to develop uh, switches. And so this is where the synthetic biology aspect of, the, of our research comes into play, because then we can essentially turn on and off the production of uh, ethanol and isobutanol so that we can control how much and when it is produced so that we can remove isobutanol as it is being made. Um, so I, I think I'm out of time. Yeah, yeah. So I'm just going to... Don't oh, make us push that button again. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think I'm just going to end here and... Uh, that was a warning. <laughs> just, just uh, let me just go through these slides real quick and just say that our ultimate plans are to produce these isobutanol uh, advanced biofuels not from, uh, not from sugars or starch, but rather from cellulosic biomass. And the reason for why this can work is because our strains are in principle agnostic. They just eat glucose and they don't care about where the source is. And this, these, uh, these different sources, whether it's starch, cellulose, or, or sugarcane, they all come from the same uh, basic molecule, which is glucose. So, um, um, so we have some uh, plants to, so as you know, uh, cellulose is much uh, dif more difficult to degrade than starch. Starch has evolved to produce, this has to be a storage of energy. This is the actual energy uh, um, currency. And then cellulose has a different architecture so that it's built for resilience to, be, to give stiffness to, to uh, wood and to plant materials. So this is why uh, uh, it's much harder to process. But as we all know, carbon, uh, even wood will rot and termites will eat our houses. So there are enzymes that can degrade cellulose. And so we are engineering these enzymes into yeast so that we can uh, uh, essentially use those enzymes to degrade the cellulose and take up these glucose molecules to produce these advanced biofuels. And with that, I'd just like to thank uh, current and former members of my lab and uh, current and former sources of funding. And thank you for your attention. Okay, so uh, we can have uh, a few questions for Jose. Uh, again, wait for the, the mic. Uh, my question is basically two. One is the, what's the highest uh, title right now that is feasible? Because if you have one gram per liter, that means for one uh, gallon of uh, fuel, you have to process 1,000 gallon of water to, to separate the micro and also to purify after that. Uh, so I think there has to be some increase in the titer in order to be more economically feasible. The second one is, what happened with uh, Jatropa? I think many of the country outside the U.S. are processing Jatropa. Would you comment on that one, please? Yeah, so, so in the first uh, question about the titers, yeah, so um, as I mentioned, the one gram per liter is not good enough. And the reason why we can't get better is twofold. One is the production, the... the, the, the uh, preference of the yeast to produce ethanol and so we have to essentially rewire the metabolism to make a new strain that will produce ethanol instead of, uh, sorry that will produce isobutanol instead of ethanol and that is compounded with the, with the factor that this isobutanol is 10 times more toxic than ethanol so then while the yeast wants to produce ethanol to be able to grow off glucose it's essentially killing itself so that's why I run out of time to go into more detail but Using synthetic biology, we can try to control that uh, uh, so that we can control when and how much isobutanol is being made so that we can remove it as it is, as it is being made. But if you look at the uh, uh, theoretical yields you can get for uh, ethanol is about 50% uh, by mass. In, gluco in, in isobutanol, it's a little bit lower. It's like in the 45%. So in theory, you can get titers that would reach uh, uh, the commercial viability that uh, we have now with, uh, with ethanol. Now, 
the refining of isobutanol is also easier than that for uh, ethanol because it's easier to separate from water. So that's an, an advantage of isobutanol. Okay. Um, and the other question was about jatropha. So jatropha is a very different crop. So that is usually uh, used for, uh, to extract lipids. And that's a totally different process, and that's for the production of, of biodiesel. And that has other challenges. Uh, in, in, in respect to biodiesel, I'm more focused again in the microorganisms, so I'm more interested in, in algae, for example. Okay, one, one more. Uh, Lisa Lee Morgan, uh, uh, class of 76, and uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, the, I, have under, I understand that the cellulosic um, crops take a great deal of energy to break the stiffness and get to the, uh, the material within the cells. Um, and isn't this uh, a, a very large parasitic load? And is, is there, a, uh, how, how close, how much of, a, of the actual energy uh, does it use to, to crack it open? So there's, there's different strategies to, to uh, so, the, so I went through it really quick, but the, the, the cellulose biomass has to be pre-treated. And so there's different strategies and a lot of technological improvement uh, going on there. Uh, like I said, there's, there's already three plants that use uh, hydrolysis uh, that includes uh, thermal and acid use. There's others, uh, I think, more exciting technologies coming online hopefully soon using the opposite, which is using basic conditions. In terms of what is the energetics, I, I can't really answer that question, but one of the interesting aspects of these newer technologies like Apex is that unlike the uh, the acid treatment, uh, the acid hydrolysis, which produces a lot of noxious compounds for the cells that ends up inhibiting fermentation, the apex is more benign for, for the cells. So down, down the line, uh, the downstream, the, the cells uh, benefit actually from uh, these newer methods to treat cellulose. But this is a very active area of research. Thanks. Okay, so uh, why don't we stop uh, here, and let's thank Jose and uh, Mom again.